Hi Wes! In our last video, Sarah and I told the story of how we narrowed down the requirements and designed a user interface for our YouTube comment tracker app. Yeah, Sarah's method for creating user interfaces together as a group was fun. You should check out that video if you're into user interface design. All right, so we got to the point where we had a mocked up user interface. Next, we needed to decide on which Google products to include when building this product. Yeah, we had some great discussions and I think we ended up with a pretty good architecture. So stay tuned and we'll take you through that decision process. So quick recap, we needed a web app that would help us stay on top of comments for our YouTube videos. We've shot over 100 videos and we can't possibly click into every video every day to see if there are new comments. It would just take too long, it would be too difficult to remember which comments were new since the last time we looked. Now we needed a new dashboard to track all of our videos. So with Sarah's help, we narrowed down to these three use cases. Then I created a user interface mockup. We sat down as a group and refined it, simplified it, took out a bunch of buttons. Yeah, and now the question was, which Google Cloud product should we use to build our app? There are over 100 to choose from. Ah, yes. Uh, now, if I remember correctly, uh, Wes, you drew this picture. I love this picture because we have YouTube on one side. The YouTube API can tell us about new comments made by viewers. And then on the other side, we need to present a web-based dashboard to users who want to read new comments as they come in. And that's like people like you and me. Right. So Sarah, you and I sat down to fill out this architecture diagram. Samra kept hammering on simplicity. Make it as simple as humanly possible. So could the web app just call the YouTube API directly? That way we wouldn't need anything else in this diagram. That was a really good question. And it spurred a useful discussion. It turns out the first use case here talks about calling out new comments that haven't been seen yet. So we need uh, to somehow remember what comments each user has already seen. Yeah, we considered storing that in the web browser's local storage, but that storage is too easy to lose. For example, if you switch to a new computer or a new phone, well, you don't want the app to show you the same comments all over again. Right. So we need a database in the cloud. The first question is SQL or NoSQL database. Well, we said this is a view and update tool, not a reporting tool. So each user will only need to see their own data, and that is which comments they've already marked as read. This means that each page in the web app will need to read dozens and hundreds of records, not thousands or millions. So a relational database is not required. Yeah, I remember that discussion. Uh, if we could pick either type of database, we said we might as well do NoSQL because it requires less setup and less code. Also, Google's NoSQL databases have free tiers. Yeah, and if we go with NoSQL in Google Cloud, the default choice is Cloud Firestore. But then the question becomes data store mode or Firestore native mode? Right. We found this page that helps you choose between the two modes. It looks like our app could actually use either. So we picked Firestore native mode because we felt that writing queries for that is a little bit easier. Uh, we also have folks on the team who are familiar with MongoDB, and the Firestore native mode API is kind of similar to that. And if I remember correctly, that started a different discussion. Firestore native mode exposes an API that web apps can access directly, so we could potentially avoid having to write any server-side code. That is a really compelling feature. Less code means fewer bugs and less maintenance work. But we figured that the web app doesn't need all the data returned by the YouTube API. We could get a more responsive client if we crunch the numbers in server-side code first and only send the processed results to the client. All right, so server-side code it is. I had hoped we could do without it. Now, the question was, where should that code run? We know that we wanted serverless to minimize ops work and maximize uptime and not have to think about machines or VMs, but should we run our code on App Engine, Cloud Functions, or Cloud Run? We figured we'd need a pretty rich server-side API with many endpoints. Uh, that means we'd probably want to use Express, Flask, or similar server-side framework. Yeah, and we've seen in previous projects that App Engine and Cloud Run play well with those frameworks. Cloud Functions is a little bit different. Right. It comes with its own framework. Uh, and that makes Cloud Functions great uh, for the use case of, I have some code. I want it to run in the cloud when I hit this particular URL. Uh, it's not meant for building complex APIs. So we were down to App Engine or Cloud Run. 
Well, containers have become the standard way of packaging and deploying cloud applications over the last decade. So we'd like to use them on this project so that other developers could help us maintain it. Cloud Run supports containers well and offers a streamlined CI CD workflow. Once our code is in a container on Cloud Run, we could move it later to a virtual machine or Kubernetes if we feel like we needed more control. I agree that containers are really popular, uh, but not everyone on our team is really familiar with them. Yeah, that's fine. Um, with Cloud Run, you can either define your own container in a Docker file and then build it, or you could submit that source code to Google and we'll do that for you using Cloud Build Packs so you don't have to know anything about containers at all. Love it. That makes it easier. So Cloud Run it is. All right, so now we know where our server-side code should run, but we had to make another decision. Let's say the user looks at a list of new YouTube comments in their web browser. Should the HTML for that list be generated on the server by Cloud Run or in a web browser by client-side JavaScript? Right. You and I have been around, Wes, so we're both comfortable with generating HTML on the server. You can do that with Django, Laravel, ASP.NET, Ruby on Rails, and other server-side frameworks. Yep, those are all good, and they have stood the test of time. But we figured that the UI would be quite dynamic. For example, when the user marks a comment as red, we'd like the UI to update instantly instead of having to do a round trip to the server to get a new HTML page. So we decided on generating the HTML on the client. That meant we had to choose a client-side framework. Angular, React, and Vue.js are three popular frameworks. Uh, now, the choice here was pretty easy, if I remember correctly. Well, yep, our team only has experience with Vue.js, so that's what we picked. I'm sure any framework would have worked, but we wanted to keep things easy for us. So now that we have a pretty smart client that generates its own HTML, how does it get the data from the server? A REST API is an easy way to do it. Uh, we sat down and defined these REST endpoints uh, that we thought we'd need. Uh, we actually got many of them right, uh, but we had to add some more later on as we understood the problem better. Yeah, and as we created that list of REST endpoints, we noticed that many of them are done in the context of a user. For example, the get slash playlist call should return playlists that the current user is subscribing to. If you and I make that call, the results should be different because we're looking at different playlists. Right, right, right. Uh, we realized that the server-side code would need a way to authenticate the user so it could return that user's playlist and not someone else's. Uh, but building a login subsystem, storing users' passwords, dealing with lost passwords, and so on, that's a lot of work. Definitely. Fortunately, there are lots of different tools that Google Cloud has that can help you. So we took a closer look at Google Sign-in, Firebase Authentication, and Cloud Identity Platform. Yep. Google Sign-In is easy to work with, but it only supports Google identities. We wanted users to be able to log in with their accounts from Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, and so on. Yeah, Firebase Auth and Cloud Identity Platform both support non-Google accounts. As we read upon them, we saw that Identity Platform is similar to Firebase Auth, but it adds some nice enterprise features. For example, you can require users to use two-factor authentication, and it comes with a nice 99.95% SLA. So, we pick Identity Platform. It's nice not to have to build another login systems. I built enough of those earlier in my career. But Wes, we needed to make one more decision. Right. The web browser needs to download the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files from somewhere. So we have at least two choices here, Firebase hosting or let Cloud Run serve the files. I really like Firebase hosting. It's easy to deploy your files to it, and it includes a CDN, so users will get their files quickly. But we decided on serving the files from Cloud Run. I'm, I'm still a little annoyed by that. Uh, why did we ever do that, Wes? Well, remember what Sarah said. Let's keep things simple and use as few tools as possible. Also, we figured that we and our coworkers who are based in the US West Coast could use the app. If we deployed the Cloud Run service to one of the US West zones, we'd get pretty good performance even without a CDN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I can add Firebase hosting in version two of the app. I'm sure you will, Martin. And that's how we designed the architecture for our application. Thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions for us or requests for topics in future episodes, please add them to the comments. And stay tuned for the next episode where we will start implementing this application. Until then.